It is today as it was then. Only in the mind of distant recall are visions seen that are not. The village destroyed by fire and fury. The shadowing sounds of war. The voices of dead comrades heard again while all is silent. This is how fighting men, like soldier poet D. Eberhardt and his comrades of the Rainbow Division, saw World War II. And now, more than a half century later, this is how the survivors remember it. When the first shell hit, I wanted to go back home. I mean, it was pet I was petrified. Everybody was. There was smoke and flame and bombs. The air was just filled with snapping, buzzing traces, just like you'd walked into a beehive. And all of a sudden, the grass seemed to be parting, like the Red Sea almost. Machine guns coming from the Germans. They bounced off within almost a hand's breadth of my, my head. I just, if I'd got another foot, I'd have been dead. This explosion right in front of my face, and I was struck across the left arm. Most uh, spine-chilling experience. And who knows if we're going to live or die. The basic thing is to move forward and keep alive. This is a story about young men in their late teens and early 20s who made up the greater part of the Rainbow Division in World War II. Most were inexperienced troops who had never fired a shot in anger. Three untested, untried regiments were suddenly ordered to hold the line against four veteran, battle-hardened Wehrmacht divisions. And they not only fought the enemy to a standstill, but actually hurled him back and shortened the war. The Rainbow was first activated in August 1917 as part of the War Department's plan to form a truly representative American division in an effort to bring the war home to the people. The division was formed from National Guard units in 26 states and the District of Columbia and brought together at Camp Mills, Long Island. Colonel Douglas MacArthur, the new division's chief of staff, upon seeing the flags from the different state guard units, said the units that comprised the division spanned the nation like a rainbow. Reporters sparked to the image, and the 42nd has been known as the rainbow ever since. During World War I, the rainbow set a record for continuous service in the trenches by an American division. Through the armistice in November 1918, it earned a reputation for courage and tenacity, advancing against the Germans, including the stunning defeat of the elite 4th Prussian Guard in a pitched battle at the Irk River. The Rainbow participated in six major campaigns and suffered one sixteenth of American casualties during the First World War. Among those killed in action was the American poet Joyce Kilmer. Five division members, including William Wild Bill Donovan, who organized the Office of Strategic Services in the Second World War, were awarded the Medal of Honor. Even the enemy accorded the Rainbow the respect of worthy adversary. A 1918 German intelligence document noted, the 42nd is in splendid fighting condition and counted among the best American divisions. When the war to end all wars was won, the Rainbow returned in triumph, mission accomplished, the job well done. But not every Rainbow soldier made it home. Just before returning to America, the men cut their rainbow patches in half and left one piece in France as a memorial to their fallen buddies. From that point on, the official division patch became the famous quarter arc. The division was deactivated in 1919. As it turned out, the war to end all wars was not won, and the peace proved to be nothing more than a short interval. Once again, there was the need for a rainbow division. A new generation of young men would now carry on the tradition. As kids who grew up and who revered the rainbow in World War I, 
as very young men, we just cheered to know that we were going to get to go to the Rainbow Division. So we entered it with good spirits and uh, went down to Camp Gruber and ultimately shipped overseas. The Rainbow was reactivated at Camp Gruber, Oklahoma, under the command of Major General Harry J. Collins, and began the arduous task of training for combat. But the war couldn't wait. In November 1944, there was a desperate need for foot soldiers to reinforce the entire southern sector of the Allied line in Alsace-Lorraine. The only units available in the United States were three infantry regiments of the 42nd Division, the 222nd, the 232nd, and the 242nd. But while they were available, they weren't ready. They hadn't completed their training. Indeed, for some, their training had hardly begun. But during wartime, need determines speed, and untested troops might be sent to a relatively quiet sector where they could continue training and get a taste of combat, or in the impersonal terminology of the military, be blooded. In mid-November 1944, the three regiments, named Task Force Linden, in honor of their commanding officer, General Henning Linden, left Camp Gruber. Unfortunately, without the 48 guns of the division artillery, the protection of division armor, and without the badly needed special troops. It is no exaggeration to say that the three regiments would be naked to the enemy. I had just turned 19 on the 12th of November, and this was like the 20th of November. And we went over, took 13 days on board ship and got landed in Marseille, France. Marseille had already been taken by the Americans. Task Force Linden landed in Marseille on December 9th, 1944. This would be the first step along the Rainbow Trail, which would extend some 450 miles across France and the breadth of Germany, marked by 114 days of combat. On Christmas Eve, Task Force Linden took up defensive positions near the Rhine River, north and east of Strasbourg, along a 19-mile front. Our task was to fill in spots along the Rhine River. Supposedly, we were to get training actually on the front line. As it turned out, this didn't happen. Just before Task Force Linden arrived, the Germans had mounted a last-ditch, go-for-broke offensive. On December 6th, just three days before the Rainbow Regiments landed in southern France, the 5th and 6th Panzer Armies, consisting of 11 divisions, attacked U.S. Army positions in the Ardennes. The Americans were overwhelmed, and many GIs were forced to surrender. Over the next two weeks, American units throughout France were thinned, as troops, including men from Task Force Linden, were pulled to reinforce the line against the German offensive at the Bulge. This is exactly what the Germans expected. They had held an army of tough seasoned divisions in reserve. A breakthrough in the south would place Nazi troops in the heart of France. It could be a brand new war. Hitler was determined to wipe out the Seventh Army and uh, figured it was a golden opportunity because uh, all of the available manpower had been sent to the Bulge. The Germans probed for a weak spot in the Seventh Army line and decided to mount Operation Nordwind against Task Force Linden, now stretched along a 31-mile front in Alsace-Lorraine. On January 5th, 1945, the Germans launched Operation Nordwind. Crack troops assaulted the rainbow positions. The cathedral song soared on high. Midnight flares lit up the sky. Tracers probed from across the Rhine and were answered in kind all down our line. It was not a gluplehis noyous yar for our young men who had come so far to freeze and die in the icy blast of the Nordwind attack, Hitler's last. We went to a town called Gamschein, and that's where we had our baptism of the fire. We couldn't believe what, what was going on. We, we took tremendous casualties. First four or five hours of combat, we lost half of our company and they were either captured, killed, or wounded. And uh, we pulled back. Uh, it was a horrifying day. We went, to, we went across this open field, and we started getting barrages of 88s were coming in at us. My best friend was killed right next to me. He was 10 yards away from me. 
and the <clears throat> shell hit between myself and him. And then we started running forward again, and he didn't move. So I went over to figure he was he was afraid or something. So I went over, I turned him over, and he was dead. And it was just a horrifying feeling. Despite a valiant effort to hold Gamsheim, the Germans had surrounded the town. Two rainbow rifle platoons, supported by machine gun and mortar sections and an anti-tank squad, were all killed or captured. It was supposed to be a quiet sector in the European theater of operations, but suddenly it had become center stage. They overwhelmed us. They just came through with those tanks. And uh, so I turned around and went back out, and there was a pattern. We tried to move certain places where we, we were safe. And you could see the pattern as it developed ahead of you. And uh, the, I made my second jump, and as I was sliding in, two bullets, so it was an automatic weapon, two bullets bounced off just as I stopped. They bounced off within almost a hand's breadth of my, my head. In its first days on the front, the raw rainbow was expected to experience a taste of warfare. Here, they weren't just blooded, but hemorrhaged. It had become a cruel program of on-the-job training, but the Rainbow learned quickly. As the German tanks advanced on the Rainbow positions, they fired point-blank on the American soldiers. In one instance, a German tank commander, whose machine guns were firing at the American riflemen in the snow, opened the hatch, stood up in his turret, and demanded, Surrender! Surrender! Don't you fools know when you are surrounded? A Rainbow infantryman answered with a blast from his Brownie automatic rifle which tore off the tank commander's arm. My first confrontation with an enemy tank. I told everybody, get cover, I'll run back to the road and see if I can get some help. And what we needed, of course, was the tank destroyer. We couldn't knock it out with any weapons that we had. I got back to the road and I looked to the right, there was nothing. I looked to the left and only in John Wayne movies would something like this happen. Here comes our battalion commander, Norman G. Reynolds in his Jeep and I gave him a signal for um, under-armored attack. He came right alongside me and said, where? And I pointed out to him. He said, OK. He said, you stay right there. He says, I'll get a TD up to you as fast as I can. He disappeared. And I stayed at the corner of the barn watching this thing coming to me. Now, so three TDs come up, not one. All of a sudden, the tide had changed. Instead of being me and the victim, being the one that's going to get killed, the German's going to get killed, and I'm going to watch this. I stood out there, and like a damn fool, I exposed myself. He fired a shell at me, not as machine guns, a shell. Missed me by three feet, it went to the foundation of the barn, blew up, and he was on top of us with both his machine guns. Why we're alive, I don't know, because the air was just filled with snapping, buzzing traces, just like you'd walked into a beehive. The regimental task force experienced extremely high losses during January, with many men killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. I was on my way back, and I got shot down with traces. I hit the ground. The traces were all around me. Fortunately, I was behind a tree. I was on my knees, and they got down further because they, they were actually digging up the ground around me. After being shot, I lost my rifle. My right hand was paralyzed. I was running back, and then I hit the ground because I, I had small arm fires all around me. For every uh, trace of the three live rounds, you see all these traces coming at you. You know those live rounds are in between. And there isn't much you can do but hide. And I hit the ground. This is what we're taught to do. I hit the ground. I saved my life. And they knew I was there, so they came right up to me, and they shot the ground right up until they got to me and told me to get up so that they knew I couldn't do a thing. When we first got captured, there was a soldier behind us with a, with a gun taking us back to somewhere, I don't know where. And we, I don't know if he was going to lead us off to shoot us or what, because the rumor was they weren't taking any prisoners. The Germans were impressed by the Rainbow's courageous defense. This made many of them doubt the original intelligence reports of the Rainbow's lack of experience. How could raw troops fight so fearlessly and effectively? Well, I think if we knew what we were up against, <laughs> it would have been a different story. We didn't know. We really didn't understand what it was all about. And we thought, we thought this was war. I mean, this was, but it really wasn't. As I found out later, this, this period that we went through was really intense by anyone's uh, rules, you know. The Germans ran into the same stubborn resistance at Hatton. 
Two days of bitter fighting ensued, but the Germans could not dislodge the 242nd. Sessenheim was the same, only it tested the metal of the 232nd, which, though surrounded, fought back through enemy lines. We were caught in an open field during a barrage, and that's the worst thing that can happen to you. But there was a nearby farmhouse, and we made for it because we wanted to hide in the cellar. And we did, and then the barrage lifted. And we came up out of the cellar, and the farmer and his wife were in the cellar with us, and they came up. And she was the most kindly elderly lady I've ever seen, and my heart went out to her because she reminded me of my grandmother. And we noticed on the mantelpiece a group of pictures, and it seems that there were a picture of 10 soldiers Five were wearing French uniforms, five were wearing German uniforms. And on closer examination, we saw that they were the same soldiers. And the farmer said, those are my five sons. And I said, well, how come they're French and German? And he told me that when the French army was practically captured to the last man, those from Alsace were offered the opportunity to enlist in the German army, and they did. And I felt very bad about it. And I turned to this very kindly lady, and I said to her, don't worry, mother, we'll get your sons back. And at that moment, her whole face changed. And she looked at me, and venom actually stabbed from her eyes, and she said to me, don't talk like that to me. We are Germans here, long live Germany. During the last week of January 1945, the Germans launched the final assault of the winter offensive to seize Alsace, which over the centuries had been contested territory between France and Germany, and had changed hands several times. General Linden called the Battle of the Motor the turning point of the German campaign in Alsace. The Rainbow halted an attack that, if successful, would have required a withdrawal all along the entire army front it was an example of courage and determination that has seldom been equaled by fighting men. Following their victory at the Motor River, the three infantry regiments were withdrawn to Chateau Salin to tend their wounds and await replacements for the 50% casualties they had suffered in their first month of fighting. By that time, our company from 160 men was down to about 50, and other companies were even worse off than we were. So it was a true baptism of fire, and uh, not a very happy one. But, but here I am, I'm still alive, so. <laughs> the Rainbow, despite its casualties, won a victory on the field of battle. But they had another foe to conquer, and that was the weather. It was said by the locals that this was the severest winter in memory. For the entire month of January, there was a bitter, biting, penetrating, almost paralyzing cold that seemed to knife through every layer of clothing. The heaviest gloves afforded little protection and scant comfort. Sergeant Dick Winters, a machine gun squad leader killed in early January, said it best. War is just frozen fingers fumbling with fractured firing pins. It may not sound romantic, but a hot bath, clean underwear, dry socks, and warm hands and feet were of the greatest importance to the average soldier. At the beginning of February 1945, Task Force Linden was joined by the remainder of the division and its commanding general, Harry Collins. The Rainbow soon moved into the line near the town of Wimmenau, north of Hagenau in the Hart Mountains, to relieve the 45th Division. Now the Rainbow could operate as a complete division. During the second half of February and early March 1945, the Rainbow increased the number of reconnaissance and combat patrols and maintained an ever-increasing pressure on a nervous enemy. Reconnaissance patrols were ordered to probe enemy positions to determine relative strength and capture prisoners who could provide intelligence. Combat patrols were larger, heavily armed, and used to smash through enemy lines. Although the Rainbow Infantry was still living for the most part in foxholes and dugouts in snowy weather, that winter of 1945 seemed to linger forever. The hardships were easier to bear. This is because it was now a fully functioning division. It had its own sources of supply and transportation. In a sense, it was no longer an orphan of the 7th Army. 
To the average GI, it now meant that hot, fresh food was being served frequently. Clean, dry clothes were available. And even on occasion, when there was a barn in the vicinity, he could see a movie. General Collins' belief in continual and relentless patrolling paid off. It kept the enemy groggy and on the defensive and subjected him to punishing fire from Rainbow Infantry and Artillery. The Rainbow learned a great deal of vital information so that when it finally started to fight its way across Germany, they knew about the weak spots, had charted the minefields and pinpointed the key defenses. On March 15, 1945, the division launched the attack that it would continue to the end of the war. Taking the enemy by complete surprise, they assaulted prepared defenses in the Hart Mountains. The Hart Mountains were properly named. They were the hardest thing we probably ever had to address. And the mountains were steep, the weather was cold, there was snow yet, and ice abounded. And we had to go over the peaks. General Collins was a great tactician for small unit operations. So rather than hit it head on, he wanted to circumvent uh, the German troops and in the valleys and the towns in the valleys. And so we all went off on the crest of these many, many hills that were small mountains. We even had to uh, have uh, mules to carry our stuff uh, you know, because it was so rugged that people were slipping and sliding all over the place. On March 18th, the Rainbow was the first unit of six corps to cross into Germany and to reach the west wall of the Siegfried Line. These German defenses were firmly entrenched with dragon teeth, pillboxes, mountain barriers, and crossfire. On March 21st, following an air bombardment by Americans and a 30-minute artillery barrage, the 222nd crossed the Saarbach River and attacked the Siegfried Line. Early the next morning, the 242nd smashed through a weak spot, sweeping through the first and second lines of the German defenses, defeating mines and roadblocks. The division raced forward, and everywhere, German soldiers threw down their arms and surrendered. We disrupted the Germans, moved them out of their positions on the Siegfried Line and up in, into the mountains, where our wonderful Light aircraft artillery observers caught the Germans in wagons, mules, trains on the hillside, in the forest, on the mountains. The artillery came in and just worked them all to hell. Now, I always carried a sketchbook with me wherever I was, and I made sketches of the Siegfried thing, the engineers blowing up pill boxes, the dead mules and horses, and uh, dead Germans all along this trail. Upon entering Germany, the status of the Rainbow changed. They were no longer the liberators they were in France. Now they were the conquerors, facing a potentially dangerous populace. It was obvious to many of the troops that the German civilians didn't know what to do. For almost five years, they had been the conquerors. Now, for the first time, they were the vanquished people. They knew full well what their armies had done. Now, what would happen to them? We knew that something was happening. They started to feed us uh, milk soup, and the German women started to give us food. And not long after that, the troops came through with their tanks, and let me tell you, that was a beautiful sight. When we first got captured, I weighed approximately 170 pounds. I was 18 and a half, 19 years old. And when I was liberated, I weighed perhaps between 138 and 140 pounds. I got captured on January 19th, and this was Holy Thursday, the 29th of March, when we got liberated. On Easter Sunday, the division prepared to attack Würzburg. This would be the first of a series of important German cities that lay across the Rainbow Trail. Each city had a different personality, although one thing they did have in common was rubble. Nuremberg was the city of Teutonic myth and legend. Schweinfurt was part of the beating industrial heart of the Reich. And Würzburg, well, it was the most beautiful city in Germany. Upon reaching the main river opposite the city, the 42nd found all the bridges had been destroyed. Würzburg was heavily defended. 
they had a stand or die order from the provincial uh, commander several thousand German troops and uh, we know it inch by inch and foot by foot because our 222nd infantry went across and the bridges were blown so they they went across the Mainz River in boats and they found one boat and they sit and went over and they got another two or three boats and they ferried back and forth a whole unit of, of the 222nd infantry that formed against the river wall a, a bridgehead and then the engineers got the bridge repaired so that the rest of the troops could go across and it, it escalated from there. We and the 232nd went across the first morning and by nighttime it cleared six city blocks of Wurzburg. The 42nd encountered snipers in every building. Using a network of tunnels beneath the streets, the defenders would outflank the rainbowmen or attack them from the rear. We shelled Wurzburg for two or three days almost steady. Because the town afforded the German infantry a very natural defensive barrier with all the damage. Any, any town that had a lot of damage afforded the uh, enemy infantry excellent hiding places for machine gun nests and bazookas and that type of thing. So as a consequence, there were places that sometimes we saw them, sometimes we didn't. Our artillery perched on the hill on the other side of the river became our biggest ally, and they, they moved us on up block by block and, and uh, until uh, we cleared the city and went on. Following Würzburg, the Rainbow's next objective was the manufacturing center of Schweinfurt. The greatest challenge here was overcoming the rings of 88 millimeter guns that defended the city. Originally placed there as anti-aircraft batteries to defend Germany's vital ball bearing plants, they would now be used against ground troops. Anybody who ever heard an 88 knows what that means. It was the most uh, spine-chilling experience in the world to be fired at by an 88. And it just seemed to spread more destruction. I think it was even more terrible than a mortar because a mortar you didn't hear. Now this you heard and it had that wail. And uh, when you actually saw what it could do to a person, it made you fear it even more. To safeguard his men from direct exposure to the 88s, General Collins decided to surround the city. We came in from an opposite direction, the, the company I was with, and we came up to an 88 battery, and they were facing in the opposite direction. And all of a sudden, we came through the woods, and there they were, and they were as shocked as we were. And uh, so we immediately went into a prone position. And I was a sergeant then, and I had a fellow on the machine gun, and he started shooting at them. But because he was laying down, the barrel of the machine gun was tilted up. You could see where the bullets were going. 10 foot over everybody's head. So I picked the gun up, and from a standing position, I started shooting it, and all of a sudden they all surrendered. In their move on the city, all three regiments encountered stiff resistance, especially from young fanatics who were hoping to slow down the Americans so that others could escape. To ensure cover for the infantrymen, three airstrikes were called in to bomb the city while not of the intensity of the 600-plane bomber raid sent earlier to destroy the ball-bearing capital, the 192 aircraft flying in support of the Rainbow did substantial damage to enemy guns. As the German 88s opened up on the Allied aircraft, the 42nd's artillery responded with effective counter-battery fire. By the time we got to Schweinfurt, they were going to have this airstrike, and we were out to watch it. So it was a fearsome place, and everybody was concerned about it. And at one point, there's a tin roof on a building where, near where we were standing, and I heard this tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. It's like rain, except a lot harder than rain. And we suddenly realized that the shrapnel was falling all around. So I better not just be observing. I better 
think about getting out of the way. So we moved back. I, I could be so dumb in war. When they finally entered Schweinfurt, the rainbow found it almost leveled by the constant bombing and artillery fire. However, the vital ball bearing industry was still operating at about 30% capacity. When these plants were finally captured, slave laborers, most from Eastern Europe, welcomed the 42nd as liberators. We were in this factory and we, we got inside and it was an underground factory. We went down to see the mess that had been made of the underground. We go down in there, there isn't a thing out of place. Every machine is oiled and just in perfect condition. They could have started turning out ball bearings again in 15 minutes. Nothing had been in that factory had been damaged in the least. The constant aerial attacks on Schweinfurt proved a point that still holds true today. With bombs and missiles, it is possible to terrorize, pulverize, even atomize a city. But in order to own it, the infantry has to go in and take it. As they entered the city, the division found the streets deserted. The crowds that had watched them march into other towns and cities were curiously absent. The people of Schweinfurt feared the Americans and were afraid of what vengeance they might extract from the city and its citizens. Within 24 hours, their reticence disappeared as hunger drove them into the streets in search of food from the American troops. By this time, the Americans were being hailed as liberators. So many were saying, mir nicht, Nazi. And of course, there were the kids. American soldiers have always had a weakness for children in war-torn countries. They crowded around and begged for chocolate and for chewing gum, which they called cow gumi, and also cigaretten for papa. On April 13th, while the division was still mopping up in Schweinfurt, word was received of President Roosevelt's death. We got word that uh, President Roosevelt had died. So the general called uh, elements of the 222nd Infantry Regiment that were, were in, uh, in that vicinity at the time, called them forth and we had all of the 48 state flags and assembled that uh, among the ruins of of uh, Schweinfurt and held a memorial service there in memory of President Roosevelt. Upon which we can begin to build under God that better world in which our children and grandchildren, yours and mine, the children and grandchildren of the whole world must live They'd taken casualties at Würzburg, at Schweinfurt, and there were more to come. None of this was supposed to be happening. The Germans were already beaten, weren't they? Wasn't it just a question of routine mopping up? The fact was, although they were moving swiftly, the Rainbow was still suffering killed and wounded. And the young soldiers, the replacements, would talk about the bullet that had their name on it. But an old soldier, 1st Sergeant of H Company, 222nd Regiment, patiently explained, don't think about the bullet that has your name on it. Worry about the one that's labeled, to whom it may concern. From Schweinfurt, the next objective was the birthplace of Nazism, Nuremberg, and its western suburb, Firth. As the home of National Socialism, SS troopers, determined Wehrmacht veterans, and soldiers of the Volkstrom were committed to defend the city with their lives. The Rainbow was one of five divisions selected to attack the Nuremberg region. Advancing on Nuremberg, the 42nd captured 500 towns as it moved toward the western edge of the city. At the town of Neustadt, on the outskirts of Nuremberg, the enemy was dug in. In an effort to limit casualties, General Collins ruled out a direct assault and encircled the town. The 232nd and elements of the 12th Armored Division moved on the town. The Germans, realizing they were cut off on three sides, withdrew and many surrendered. It seemed that many German soldiers were trying to think things through. For most of their lives, they had been subjected to the Nazi philosophy which for them had gone beyond politics 
and had achieved the status of a religion. They had pledged unconditionally to die for the Fuhrer. And now, what? When it came down to it, for most, with the exception of the wildest fanatics, they chose life over death. Unfortunately, there were enough of the fanatics to force the Rainbow and other Allied troops to engage in bloody fighting. The city was in chaos, flooded with refugees and retreating German soldiers. The civilian authorities wanted to surrender to the Americans. But the military prevailed with its plan for the soldiers in Firth to mount a last defensive effort and then, under the cover of nightfall, withdraw their 7,500 troops to strengthen the defense of Nuremberg. But the Rainbow Infantry had moved too rapidly for the Wehrmacht to evacuate their troops in time, attacking a day before the enemy anticipated. Nearly 5,000 German soldiers were caught and forced to surrender. Unlike the citizens of Schweinfurt, the people of Firth came out of their homes to greet the victorious Americans. By this time, the American army had become the proverbial bandwagon, and everyone wanted to hop on board. With Firth and Nuremberg taken, the division turned south to the Danube River, heading toward the German redoubt area in the Alps, where Hitler was to make his last stand. At Donauwörth, a vital link in the redoubt defenses, the SS decided to stage a defense. By this time, the 42nd had far outrun its supply lines. The division quartermaster was bringing in supplies from nearly 200 miles behind the lines, but food, fuel, and ammunition always made it to the front. The challenge we faced supplying the division that we had to go to army depot and pick up all the supplies, both food, uh, clothing and gasoline and oil for the uh, division and all the attached units. And we managed to do this by and send in six, eight trucks every week to pick up the supplies, loaded up the trucks and brought them back the next day and got them up to the division. By destroying the bridges across the dam, the Germans trapped their own troops north of the river, leaving them to stage a last ditch defense at Donauwörth. Finding all the bridges destroyed, engineering battalions, under heavy fire, constructed a makeshift footbridge over the twisted metal of the blown span. The 222nd 2nd Battalion, supported by tanks, fought their way into Donauwörth and for six hours engaged in bitter house-to-house -house fighting. Enemy resistance was so fierce and determined that by the end of the battle, only 17 prisoners were taken in the city. It was proof that one can never breathe easy even though victory was certain. On the northern end of the division zone lay the town of Dachau. As one veteran of the 222nd reported, we moved into the vicinity of Dachau. The approach to the town was heavily mined and cluttered with defensive positions. Dachau's gate opened wide, swallowing prisoners for a dozen years, incubator for the Holocaust, long, hard roads and a collision course for victims in their gray-blue stripes, for black SS and their capos, for 7th Army, 15th Corps, Rainbow 42nd, Thunderbird 45th, all of their dead pointing the way. Explosion for the world to see. Skeletons alive and dead. Liberators tears of rage. SS sprawled in the coal yard. Unmourned by those behind the wire. Grill ironwork gate swung open. Crematorium doors clanged shut. Nazi twilight at the end of April. On April 29, 1945, the 2nd Battalion of the 222nd Regiment reached the Dachau concentration camp, the original and the most notorious of all the Nazi concentration camps, KZ, or Kazentrasenslaga Dachau. The sight of the camp and the atrocities that occurred had a profound effect on the men of the rainbow. One GI said, just imagine, something you encounter without warning becomes the indelible memory of your lifetime. We knew there were concentration camps, but we had no idea how horrible they were. When we walked in there, 
I couldn't believe uh, you know, what I was seeing. It was like walking into the twilight zone. There were these walking skeletons going around, coming up to us, and then dropping dead in front of you. I was 18 years old. That made a very deep impression on me. And others were laying on the ground, looking up at you, very weak, and you didn't know if they realized they were now free because they couldn't show any emotion. They were so uh, out of it, you might say. In war, when you're infantrymen, combat tends to harden you to what you're viewing there, the death and destruction. But this was inhumanity to these poor people, with what they were doing to them. And uh, it just got worse and worse. We saw the boxcars. Well, I, I'll never forget that. On a railroad siding outside of the camp, there were 50 boxcars, each one a tomb, crowded with the bodies of prisoners who had been starved or shot to death. As they were looking through one of the boxcars, Colonel Donald Downard and Captain Roy Welburn heard faint cries coming from the pile of the dead. Climbing over the corpses, they found a lone survivor. There were more than 2,000 prisoners on that train. He was the only one still alive, and just barely. Life was it was quite terrible. I mean, you had two problems. You were hungry all the time, and you you were you had the fear and the anxiety, and uh, you never knew what would happen. You know, you were to, to continuously exposed to that. Uh, terror in the morning, you had to get up early and stand in the outside to be counted. And then in the evening, you stood outside in every weather and had to be counted. And uh, uh, you were hungry and weak, you know. You were in terribly weak shape, you know. It was, uh, when you go through hunger for a long time, you get emaciated. And uh, many times, uh, mo mo many prisoners, Emotionally and physically, we are completely exhausted. And, uh, and of course, some take it worse, and some, some break down completely. And uh, it is very, very difficult to describe to anybody who hasn't been through what it means to be continuously uh, exposed. You know, the clothing was not sufficient and be terrorized over a certain length of time. I mean, it is very extremely difficult to grasp that even after years, you cannot, sometimes you think, could that have been really happened? It is. Uh, the whole mind and body and the emotion change, I mean, under that influence of, of starvation and terror and mistreatment. After touring a concentration camp, General Eisenhower wrote a letter to Army Chief of Staff Marshall. It revealed his emotion at the sight of the camp and his fear that future generations would one day try to erase any memory of the horror that had occurred. I made the visit deliberately, he wrote, in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things. If ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda, I felt that the evidence should be immediately placed before the American and British public in a fashion that would leave no doubt, no room for cynical doubt. He said, you better take your sketchbook up there. And go. I went up the next morning. and went in and there were the railroad sidings with the frozen bodies on them. Some had been shot trying to escape or move what. And uh, went in and was confronted with the uh, gas chambers with the stacks of, of clothing outside. They'd been conned in saying, well, we're going to give you a shower. Here's a soap and towel. Go on in and get a nice shower. And they closed the door. And then they went out the next room and were stacked bodies, just indiscriminately stacked like cordwood. Somebody uh, whispered there, it was like the devil's wood pile. And I can still uh, smell the acrid stench of that smell of death there. In the next room were, were the ovens, some still smoking with bones in, inside the open doors where the bodies were just unceremoniously dumped in and cremated. I just went out reeling, stunned, 
uh, overwhelmed w with that experience, even though I made myself stand there and draw these dead bodies in the ovens and the sidecars and so on. And then I got out there, got away, and went back to the division CP and almost said, couldn't talk for, for a period of time. I'm just overwhelmed. As one of the few American divisions to capture a concentration camp, the men of the Rainbow understood the war where it mattered and hurt the most, in the heart and in the gut. Sunday, April 29, 1945, was also a memorable day for Corporal Morris Ike Eisenstein of H Company, 222nd Regiment. On this day, he received two stars. In the morning, just outside of Dachau, when his unit was pinned down by enemy fire, he operated his machine gun from a completely exposed position and at the greatest danger to himself, was able to destroy the Nazi strong point. For this, the army awarded him the Silver Star. In the afternoon, when he entered the concentration camp, he came across a very old prisoner who was weeping quietly and repeating the two words, alles kaputt, all is lost. Hoping to help the poor man, he tried to give him some money. But the prisoner still had his pride, as Ike tells it. He refused to take it, Ike said. I asked him why. He said, because I have nothing to give you in return. So I pointed to the cloth badge he wore with the Star of David on it, and I asked him, may I have that? I took the badge home with me. To this day, Ike is justly proud of both those unforgettable stars. The next day, April 30th, the Rainbow entered Munich and captured the center of the city. The site of the Rothhaus beer cellar, where Hitler established the Nazi party in the late 1920s. Munich was in chaos when the American troops arrived. An uprising two days earlier had failed, and the Wehrmacht had not succeeded in blowing the bridges to prevent the Americans from entering the city. About the time the Rainbow got to Munich and beyond, the war was as good as over, it was grinding down and everything was in a state of total anarchy, confusion. There were liberated slave laborers all over the uh, landscape, and there were SS men trying to slip away. The Rainbow helped restore order in the city, and then pushed on to the Austrian border. South of Munich, the 242nd captured the airport, and with it, 1,500 German troops and aircraft. By the time the division reached the Austrian border, the war was almost over. At this point, there was little or no resistance, but the Rainbow was busy collecting thousands of prisoners of war and transporting them to the rear. After the German surrender, the Rainbow went into occupation duty in Austria. Its mission was to help reestablish normal economic and political life. It was a formidable task. And now it was 1946, time for a proud Rainbow division to go home. This Rainbow Division lived up to its honored traditions. It had captured 6,000 square miles of enemy territory and taken 45,000 prisoners. Like the Rainbow of World War I, it had left many of its best and brightest in the European Earth. For the World War II incarnation of the Rainbow Division, it was all over. All the perils, the fighting, the fear, the freezing, the suspense, the killing, the being killed. It was all replaced by the well-earned satisfaction of knowing that the mission was accomplished. I think it's really our duty with the, the years we have remaining to see that people never forget this. We were extremely grateful. It has never been more clear why a war was fought. They were really the saviors, saviors.